Hey everyone, welcome to week 38. This is day one. This is our new empty apartment. apartment. Um, and for this week, we are going to do the what can I learn from Rembrandt. You know, we posted the images last week. Danny uh, wasn't feeling so well. Her eyes were horrible, uh, but now she's good. And we're gonna uh, post the videos of those images during this week. So. For today, we're gonna to concentrate on one aspect of Rembrandt and it's gonna be self-portraits. So let's see how we're gonna do. You guys already know the painting, so I don't know. Act surprised, I guess. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Now for this week, there's gonna be a new theme. And I was telling you guys last week on my Instagram feed that if you guys feel that this is something that can be interesting, uh, we could do it with a bunch of other artists. So this could be a recurring theme for uh, future weeks. Uh, this theme is going to be called, What Can I Learn From? And the idea is that we can pick a single artist. And in this week, we can observe and focus in on five different aspects of that artist and see how we can apply those aspects into our own work. Now, and this is super, super important, we are not trying to paint like those artists. First of all, because we can't. As much as we adore, you know, whomever we are focusing in on for that week, as much as we think we have empathy with their work, we are in a completely different context. So chances are, that we're never going to be able to paint like somebody else. And some people may think that that's a curse. I actually feel that that is a blessing. Once you very quickly accept that you can't paint like anybody else but yourself, then you start walking your own path and you start realizing, well, this is not about painting like somebody else, albeit somebody who's incredibly talented and adored throughout the centuries. It doesn't matter. We have to stop thinking that if we paint closer or reminiscent to people that were masters, that doesn't mean that our work is going to be inherently good. It doesn't mean that by osmosis then, just by relating one work to the other, our work is then going to be good. No. Just by feeling close to those people, just by trying to evoke what they painted, that's not enough to justify our own personal efforts. Uh, what I always tell people is that you can be moved by those people. You know, you can be moved to tears, like your knees can buckle and you can feel like this emptiness in your stomach and you can shed a tear. And that kind of tells you that you have a very deep connection with what you're looking at. You're being moved by, you know, this painting that was created by this amazing painter. But that doesn't mean that we have to replicate that. That doesn't mean that we have to, in order to access those feelings that were produced in us, that doesn't mean that we have to then paint like them. We have to really kind of separate the two. And what we're going to do during the week is to say, yeah, I accept that this is something that moves me, but let me see if I can try and dissect it a little bit and let me see if, you know, for five days, I can just concentrate on one little piece of that puzzle and see if I can make a painting that in some way speaks about that thing that moves me in this painter's work. For this week, we are going to pick, I think it's the best painter of all time. Honestly, this would be a ridiculous argument to have because if somebody says it's Velázquez or somebody says it's Rubens or Van Dyck or Van Eyck or like me, I would say Rembrandt, in, in the end, we're probably all right. You know, there's, there's no point in saying who the better painter was. All we're doing is just fighting for who moves us the most. You know, objectively, we can't really establish who had a bigger impact. At that moment of painting, High Renaissance and Baroque, it was such an impactful moment for the development of our practice that these people were giants. You know, the way they affected painting, each one of them, and many, many painters more that came after them, it's just almost immeasurable. You know, we can't really quantify the effect that they had in painting history. So it's kind of dumb to try and qualify them and say, yeah, my top painter is, you know, blank. But to me, the one constant that I've had in my life, ever since I was conscious about painting and ever since I looked at a Rembrandt reproduction in a book, Rembrandt has been that painter for me. I mean, above everyone else. I think there's something there that feels 
grounded, that feels very, very human. And it probably has to do with him being Dutch, but there is just like an earthly quality to his work that is very different from what was going on, let's say, in Italy or in Spain or in Germany or in Belgium at the time. So to me, that sensibility is something that connects very, very deeply. And it's at the root of my own belief. You know, those are the beliefs that I've constructed my painting upon. So whenever I see Rembrandt, it's like, you know, that's the God I prayed to. Sounds hyperbolic, but it's not really. I mean, when we understand that one artist moves us more than any other artist out there, we kind of have to accept that there is a deeply rooted sensibility there that it's telling you, hey, pay attention to this because this probably has to do with who you are. So it's very, very important to understand that this is who we are, but it's also, like I said, very important to know that we can't paint like Rembrandt. We just can't. I've often told the story, but I copied, I think it was three or four Rembrandts at the Met, and they were all terrible. I mean, terrible in the sense that, yeah, I'm sure that if you look at the paintings, you could say, oh yeah, that's Rembrandt's self-portrait with that big hat that's at the Met. Or, yeah, that's the guy with the magnifying glass. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, they're not terrible in the sense that I copied something and you can't tell who the painter is or what painting it is. No, no, no. It's very plain and very obvious that these are copies done, you know, from life at the museum where I was trying really not to just copy but decipher the way in which he worked. And, you know, when you add up those copies that I did of Rembrandt, there were months. I mean, it was months and months of painting and months and months of looking at Rembrandt, months and months of just reading about Rembrandt and trying to figure out how he painted. Also understanding that I couldn't just replicate how he painted, you know, to a T. I couldn't really prime a canvas the way he would prime it. I couldn't prepare my colors the way, you know, they were prepared in a Rembrandt workshop. I couldn't use the same pigments. So there were a lot of let's not call them limitations, but there were, there were a lot of variables that I couldn't really replicate. But even though I couldn't be granular about it and I couldn't just say, okay, I know that he would first have this umber ground and uh, he would apply all this lead paint for his lights. And then it was just a matter of putting more opaque paint down, but also glazing, but also respecting transparent areas and not overworking a painting. Like I could identify everything that I had to do when trying to mimic what Rembrandt was doing, or at least trying to establish what were those teachings that I could gather from his paintings. I can rationally do this, and yet I was completely incapable of evoking the same things he could evoke when he was painting. And that is just this honest, very sad truth, because I remember somebody telling me, and this was years ago, how there was no secret to how Rembrandt painted. I mean, he had come from a Dutch school of painting, and he became the head of a school of thought and a school of painting. So that means that somebody introduced him to how to paint, and then he actually taught and he shared how he painted with a ton of people. A ton of people. I mean, these painters were surrounded by people that were constantly learning from them and constantly watching them paint. So there were no secrets. It's not like Rembrandt used this magic sauce in his medium. No, every single person there painted with the same paints, same mediums, same ground, same linen, everything, every variable was the same. So this was just a manner of how he understood paint, how he manipulated. And that is something that I don't know, that it's just so difficult to pass on to other people and even to verbally express. I remember, you know, one time a person asked me, oh, what brushes do you use? And I told him, because I've always been honest about all my materials and I don't think that they are relevant in any way, to be completely honest. And I told them what I used and they bought some of those brushes and they were like, oh, these brushes are crap. You know, you must be using something else. And I was like, not really. And I asked them, you know, show me, show me how you use those brushes. And he started painting and I was like, well, that's the thing. I think you're applying way too much pressure on your brush when you're painting. And he was like, what do you mean? Like, that's crazy. That's not really like a variable. That's not something that I had in mind. And I grabbed a brush and I started painting and I told him like, 
there's not a single way to use a brush. There's not like a brush stroke. A brush doesn't produce like a single brush stroke. A brush is actually a tool that can be manipulated in so many ways. So I told him, I have very heavy hands, I think, but I also think I have like a soft touch. And when I drag my brush on top of the surface, I actually don't press onto the surface, you know, that hard. I actually just very lightly almost tickle my surface. You know, I let the brush do the work. I, I don't let my pressure over the brush do the work. So I let those hairs and those bristles actually deposit paint instead of me just forcefully just trying to impose paint on the surface with the brush. And that made a huge difference to that person because they honestly thought that either I was lying, you know, I wasn't sharing information that was precious to me about my materials because, you know, we always think that painters have these secret formulas and they don't share them because they are the secret to their success. So if they kind of keep their cards like close to them, then nobody's going to be able to replicate what they do. They're going to be the only ones that are capable of doing what they do. I think that that's crap. I really do think that that attitude is one of the worst and most harmful things to not only painting, but just the act of teaching, of passing on information and the act of learning, of trying to attempt to learn about, you know, in this case, painting. I really, really despise that. Whenever a painter doesn't share something as if it's like a secret sauce, I'm like, okay, goodbye. Like fundamentally, we really can't be friends because I don't think painting is about that. I don't think painting is about making these very peculiar uh, discoveries and then thinking that our own painting lies within those discoveries. That if we share this information, then we are nothing. If, if we are that fragile, if we are that insecure about our own voice that we think that this dumb sauce, this dumb secret sauce, this dumb ingredient holds everything together, then perhaps we're not as strong a painter as we think we are. So I'm always of the uh, mindset that we share everything. We speak very openly about every single step that we make when we create a painting, when we construct a painting. And if people can replicate that, then that's wonderful. But we're also acknowledging that a painting's value does not lie in the uh, construction of the painting. There's a lot of things that are accessible to us if we follow certain steps when constructing a painting. And then we can feel there's an echo between what we're doing and what we look up to. But that doesn't mean that we are going to be able to, as in this case, to paint like Rembrandt. We're not. Nobody. I've, I've never seen anyone paint like Rembrandt. It's crazy. I've never seen any contemporary painters paint like Rembrandt. I've never seen a painter paint like Rembrandt for centuries. And I'm probably sure that people have been trying to emulate the way he worked for centuries. And it is frankly impossible. So... When this week is called, what can I learn from? Rembrandt is the important part of that, but the most important part of this is what can I learn from this? You know, how can I take information that I think is valuable from this artist's work? And, you know, this is the uh, tough part, and this is the part where we have to actually exert some effort. How do I apply it to my own experience? How do I really translate that into something that I can use within my own painting practice? That is the most important part. So it's not just about sitting down and getting all this information and we learned something from Rembrandt. No, it's actually saying, okay, this is going to be an open book and let me see what I can try and learn from this and hopefully apply it in my own work. Maybe it takes time. Maybe we can recognize what we enjoy and what moves us about this particular artist's work, but we are not quite there and we don't have the ability to say, I can apply it now to my own practice. That's gonna be a very tough part. We have to be honest with ourselves and we have to say, okay, I can't get frustrated if I identified it, but as soon as I start painting, I just can't do it. It will take time. We are all in different moments of development in our painting. And we can't rush that. The cool thing is that these teachings and the things that we can gather from them, they are very patient. They are extremely patient. So they can wait for us for years. If we just keep like a little notebook or we keep, you know, all these thoughts organized in our head, they are going to be there for as long as we need them to be. And they will be ready once we're able to fully understand them and put them to use. So don't worry. Don't try to rush anything. Work as hard as you can. But, 
you know, if you hit your limit, if you hit that wall that has to do with experience and knowledge, don't just brute force it because you're not going to be able to climb that wall just out of brute force. It's not going to happen. A very beautiful staircase will be built, you know, with the passage of time and you don't have to just crack your head open trying to ram into this wall. So as long as time passes and as long as it finds you working really hard and trying to reflect upon what you're doing, these beautiful steps that go up the wall are going to be slowly, slowly forming and you're going to be able to climb that wall super easily. But it takes time and it takes patience. So again, those teachings, they're going to be there for you, waiting for you. So let's get started. We're going to focus in on self-portraits. Why self-portraits? Because Rembrandt is probably the most important painter in terms of that particular practice, in terms of that particular genre. Um, why is it a specific genre? Well, portrait painting should be the genre, right? And a subcategory should be self-portraits. But I actually think they're two very different things. The fact that when we are painting somebody else's portrait, and let's try to contextually understand it in, you know, the 17th century with Rembrandt, but also as, you know, a broader practice that has upheld almost its nature up till now. Portrait painting is really almost dominated by an artist painting a wealthier, a more powerful patron. And they want that portrait to be this piece of art that stands the uh, passage of time, that almost defies the passage of time. And it serves as a reminder of how bright or how powerful or how kind that particular person was. So it is a statement that will stand the pass of time. It has to do, yes, with the painter, but it obviously, in that case, which again is the case with many, many, uh, the vast majority of the portraits that are out there, it also has to do with the sitter. I would argue that it has more to do about the sitter than about the way the artist is able to uh, represent that sitter. Now there are extremely powerful artists that have been able to almost impose themselves over the uh, representation of that sitter, over the uh, depiction of that sitter. And the painting speaks about, yes, the sitter, but also about the artist. So yes, obviously those artists exist, like for example, Lucian Freud. But usually they do have to answer to a sitter and they do have to answer to the way the sitter wants to be portrayed, to the message that they want to be conveyed by the painting. So there's a ton of variables that are almost obstructing this very kind of clear path of communication that is created between a sitter and a painter. And I think that that's where with many portraits, a lot of people disconnect because they do feel that it's almost like a small propaganda piece of how that particular subject wanted to be portrayed. And as soon as they realized that this was almost like a a one-way street where the observer, where the viewer is only receiving this information of how grand the sitter was, then people are turned off by it because they don't feel like they can play an active role in the um, reception of that painting, in the reception of that information. The wonderful thing about self-portraits, which I think is vastly different from just painting a portrait, particularly of, you know, powerful patrons, again, that has been the constant throughout portraiture. When a painter, when an artist looks at herself and is deciding to paint herself, uh, there's nobody else to answer but herself. When they decide that they are going to turn their gaze onto themselves, there is an enormous difference. There's almost like this unobstructed view. Now, it's not completely unobstructed because our biases can create obstacles and our ego can create obstacles. And we may act as our patrons and we may feel that, yeah, we want to portray ourselves as this very powerful, you know, all-knowing, huge ego being. And that's the image that we want to convey. Yeah, the risk is there to, in a way, lie through our painting. But, but, chances are that we have experiences, we have paintings, we have painters throughout history that have taught us that if we just put our guard down and we just look at ourselves with no prejudice and we just answer to what we see and we accept the way in which we understand ourselves, or at least we try to come to terms and, and accept the way we see ourselves. You know, self-portraiture is a fascinating reminder 
of how we can explore ourselves through the act of painting and how the idea of this, you know, viewer that lies outside this exchange that we have with ourselves is kind of eliminated. You, you don't think about it. When you're doing a self-portrait, you are painting yourself for yourself. You know, this is a painting done by me for me. So in that sense, I think Rembrandt has one of the most honest examples of how to look at yourself without any desire to turn oneself into a grand subject matter. He saw himself for who he was. And this is so strange if you think about it, because how can we, four centuries later, suppose who he was? How can we say for a fact, yeah, this man is being honest when he portrays himself. Yeah, this is his soul. These are the bare bones of this human being. This is like this pound of feeling, you know, suffering flesh. How can we say that? How can we say that for a fact? Because we didn't know him. We didn't know him. I mean, there are bios of him and we can understand him contextually. But why do we really think that that is an honest portrayal of that man? And this is something that's just fascinating because... We, we can't really say that. We can't objectively say we are right when we make that assumption. That only reminds us in the end that what makes something feel human, that what makes a painting able to tap into the core of our humanity is something that we don't understand. It's something that doesn't lie in formal aspects of painting. It's just something that is there that was able to be captured by a very sensitive human being. And that's about it. You know, we, we can't try to look farther for something that we're never going to find. There's never going to be something there. There's not a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. There's nothing there. And that's what's probably most amazing, that when we realize that there is nothing special, there's, again no secret sauce in terms of formal aspects of constructing a painting. And there probably isn't a measurable way of how to say, yeah, this is how to depict yourself as a soulful person. None of that exists. There's no formulas for any of that. So it has to do with how we look at ourselves, with, with the manner in which we decide to look at ourselves and not just portray ourselves for somebody else. I think that it is imperative that when we paint ourselves, when we are trying to define things for ourselves, the other can't play a role in this equation. You know, I know that part of art and part of painting is socializing, and it's a very, very important part of what we do. But there are cases where we can paint. And even though, you know, like today, we can just share an image and, you know, pray for likes and then thank God that we are validated. Uh, even though that may happen after the fact, while we're painting, we have to remind ourselves, this is for me. This is for me. I don't care to show it to anyone. I'm going to spend hours doing this. And even if I don't show it to anyone, even if I don't share it, even if it doesn't get a single like, it doesn't matter. It was done for myself. This belongs to me. This is for me. I don't care if you like it or not. I don't care how you feel about it. I really don't like I can't care about those things when I'm painting myself because the way the other person perceives the way the viewer may perceive the painting is something that can start to distort the way you want to present yourself. So no, this is just about you and yourself. This is about you examining yourself and trying, trying to come to terms with who you are through painting. I think that that's a fascinating thing. I think Rembrandt is by far almost untouched through history as the greatest, for me, he's the greatest painter ever, but as the greatest painter that has been able to portray himself ever. I really don't think anyone, anyone comes even close to what he was able to achieve. All of his self-portraits are absolute gems. They are human beings. They depict our humanity. You know, I am a Colombian painter that lives in South America 350 years after his death, and I look at his work, this guy in Holland that died in 1669, and I feel that he represents our species. That when I look at those paintings, I'm like, yes, that's who we are. Like if an alien, you know, materialized from thin air and wanted to learn about who we are, I, I would think that that is who we are. I could present a self-portrait of Rembrandt and say, 
this is us. This is how we feel. This is how we suffer. This is how proud we are. This is how introspective we could be. This is how we can look at ourselves and reflect upon ourselves and our existence. This is how honest we can be with our own nature. I think that that's Rembrandt. And yes, there's been incredible painters throughout time that have done other amazing self-portraits, but nobody comes even close. I mean, let's not even fight about this. That was it. That was uh, self-portrait. I was very happy to do my own. And tomorrow for Spanish Tuesdays, Martes de Español, we're going to tap into a- another aspect of Rembrandt. Remember, this is not about painting like Rembrandt because we can't. Period. Easy peasy. Such an easy thing to accept. Uh, what we're trying to do is apply those teachings to our own work. And we'll see how we do. But that's tomorrow, Spanish Tuesdays. Brush up on your Spanish. See you guys later. By the way, thank you guys. You were super nice um, sending all those messages for Danny. She's good. She's good now. She's awesome. I mean, the fact that there's a video now speaks about how hard she works and how she feels better. So you guys were super cool. So thank you. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow then. Spanish Tuesdays. Thank you. Bye.